Uh, welcome uh, to our series, our continuing series on the prophets and the messengers. And we are in um, our number 31, the 1910 to 1930 in review and revising of uh, EG White writings. Warning, warnings given of uh, the future. Um, I had in plan to present this, but uh, due to the previous two presentations, I'm forced to be able to present this. And so may we ask the Lord's presence as we go through the materials. My dear Father in heaven, glory and honor be unto thee. That Lord, you have given us this history to be an example unto us who have come to the end of the earth, of this world history. We praise your holy name. And so may we learn from our past. This is my prayer in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. And so I believe that uh, we are continuing to learn every day and uh, that uh, the Lord has been uh, gracious enough to make us have uh, this information and uh, it is not in vain that um, we study the things that uh, we do study it is for our learning it is for our admonition and uh, we just praise the lord that uh, he wants us to continue growing in spirit um, E.G. White in 1910, while her, uh, her health was uh, frail and uh, was feeble, uh, she had some things to speak about when she saw what will be uh, happening in the future, what uh, will be happening in the future. And uh, in letter 70, 1910, there's something that uh, she writes uh, in warning of uh, the leaders at uh, the Battle Creek. She says, Message after message has come to me from the Lord concerning the danger surrounding you and Elder Prescott. This is uh, writing to A.G. Daniels. I have seen that Saturn would have been greatly pleased to see Elders Prescott and Daniels undertake the work of general overhauling of our books that have done a good work in the field for years. But neither of you is called of God to that work. I have been instructed that the Lord is not the author of the proposal to make many changes in the books already established. This is a, a quite interesting statement. You find... Um, in E.G. White's writing, warning um, E.G. Daniels and Prescott. Because the reason I present this is because of uh, the continued controversy on the uh, what was the fundamental principle concerning the personality of God in Christ and how the changes came in and all that stuff. And E.G. Daniels, to some extent, was involved in this directly, but he had received a warning back in 1910 from E.G. White. And so I think this is relevant. And uh, why should I bring this in uh, in the presentation or in the series, The Prophets and the Messengers? It is just to show how these people went through their lives, that is, the messengers and the prophets, and how they could see things that uh, normal people could not see or ordinary people could not uh, see. Sorry for saying normal, but ordinary people could see. She warns Daniels and Prescott that it is not good to overhaul this book because they'll bring a lot of changes which will impact our beliefs or our principles. And so by the end of uh, the 1930s, the last meaning old guard and pioneers had died and uh, a new generation of Adventist leaders was coming into prominence. General Conference Session minutes for January 16, 1940 recorded the discussion of editing of Uriah Smith's Daniel and the Revelation. And in 1910, remember that she had warned them, don't be in this habit of overhauling 
uh, our work because they really bring a very uh, different meaning to our beliefs or our principles. And so in that general conference session in 1914, we read of the minutes to overhaul the book uh, done in, in the Revelation. And uh, this is what we read. Um, the chairman stated that the matter of uh, republication of the book Daniel and Revelation was brought up at the last autumn council and in the discussion, it was agreed that if the book were to be republished, it should be a project undertaken by all the North American publishing houses and that the book should be modernized. But nine months later, nothing had yet been done. Consideration was given to the question of the revision and republication of the book Daniel and Revelation, which was allowed to go out of print some years ago. It was reported that there is a large demand from the field for it is republication in subscription book form. While it was agreed that we ought to have a book for circulation at the present time on the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation, there was quite a difference of opinion as to the advisability of attempting to revise this book. After discussion of the arguments offered in favor of and opposed to the republication of the book, it was voted to refer the matter to the officers of the general conference and the heads of the three publishing houses for further study. General conference session minutes October 23, uh, 1914. And so Obviously, there was a dispute over the use of uh, Smith's book. It had long been a popular and prof profitable book, and even yet there was a large demand for its continued uh, availability. However, there was also significant opposition to its publication, so much that two years later, progress on settling the matter was still in committee, now a subcommittee. And uh, let me say that... Um, uh, there are very good things found in the book of Daniel Revelation when it comes to the history and the prophecies and uh, the prophetess endorsed it. But yet we should not take endorsement of something to be infallibility. Yet I won't go into all that stuff, but uh, uh, Prescott and Daniels were warned about uh, changing, overhauling these books and bringing in new ideas that uh, will really change uh, the fundamental principles. And so in 1942, um, uh, in uh, General Conference Committee Minutes, General uh, 1, 1942, we find that the General Conference Committee at the time of the 1940 Autumn Council appointed a committee consisting of the managers of uh, the three publishing houses and the General Conference officers to give attention to the bringing out of uh, a revised edition of uh, the Daniel and Revelation uh, by Uriah Smith, which has in turn appointed a committee of the revision of the book. This committee is not yet ready to report. So a committee was selected, which in turn selected a committee. The committee came back two weeks later and reported that the original committee was nearly ready to present its recommendation on the production of uh, a revised edition of Daniel and Revelation. So it was voted that we earnestly recommend to the Southern Publishing Association that the edition of Daniel and Revelation be withheld from circulation pending decision on the report of the committee appointed at the time of the Autumn Council of 1940. Um, when uh, the subcommittee finally presented its report in April, it was recommended that, and I'd like us to read this uh, recommendation, uh, uh, what the subcommittee had for the recommendations. Very interesting recommendations. Uh, we read the number one, the republication of Daniel, the revelation as a subscription book in a revised volume. This is what was agreed that the republication of Daniel and the revelation as a subscription book in a revised volume. Two, that a special book committee of 11 members on revision be appointed with representation from the three publishing houses of North America, giving them power to act in revising and preparing the book for publication. Number three, 
that the revised edition of Daniel and the Revelation be published by the three publishing houses, and number four, that the proposed revised edition of Daniel and the Revelation take the place of all editions now published, General Conference Committee minutes, April 7, 1942. Now, this is fishy matters, that the revised edition take, uh, take what? It takes uh, the place of all editions now published, meaning to some extent that we won't have the previous editions, but only the new editions. And that is why some took um, a, a very cautious uh, uh, step and retained the copy and uh, the manuscript of uh, the old edition, even though uh, 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 some agreed that a new edition may take uh, uh, the place of uh, uh, the other editions. Now, continued on, we read that um, Warren Eugene Howell, chairman of the committee, assigned the task of editing Daniel and the Revelation included in his report a brief history of the book, noting it had begun its life as a series of articles in the 1862 Review and Herald. It was then recorded in the minutes. An agreement was entered into at the beginning of the work that in all matters touching doctrine or the rights and privileges of the author, no action would be recorded to be carried out until it could be made unanimous in the committee and that resolution was carried through there being unity and harmony throughout the work. This is the general conference uh, uh, committee uh, minutes. Uh, April 7, 1942. The committee realized that any revision of Daniel and Revelation was still a highly sensitive matter. This is now the gist of the matter in this presentation. The committee realized that any revision of Daniel and Revelation was still a highly sensitive matter. And this is in a movement of destiny, but by uh, Leroy Froom, page 424. Nevertheless, the next logical question and i want you to see this what little if room admits about editing the daniel and revelation book the next logical and inevitable step in the implementing of our unified fundamental beliefs not principles involved revision of certain standard works so as to eliminate statements that taught and thus perpetuated erroneous views on the godhead the first and the most consistent Sequence of this involved certain erroneous theological concept that had long appeared in Thoughts on Daniel and the Revelation by Uriah Smith, who had died in 1903. This is Leroy from Movement of Destiny, page 422 to 423 in 1971, talking about uh, why they had to wait until all the pioneers of the movement were not there so as to edit Daniel and Revelation. And why would they edit it? To remove the erroneous views of the Godhead. Now, it is interesting, when uh, we go through the history of Adventism in um, 1950 to 1955, when uh, 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 Walter Martin and uh, uh, Donald Gray Burnhouse had uh, this project. In fact, um, uh, Walter Martin um, was writing a book on the uh, kingdom of cults, and um, Donald Burnhouse was uh, having uh, a series of presentations on righteousness by faith, which the president of the general conference uh, had it, uh, that is Figaro, and um, sent him, that is Donald uh, Gray Burnhouse, uh, a book, Steps on Christ, so that it may help him even have a better way of um, uh, uh, viewing the, the issue of the righteousness by faith. Now, Donald Burnhouse conducted his son-in-law, Walter Martin, and uh, told him how Adventism had approached him. And he was writing about the kingdom of cults and uh, Seventh-day Adventism was uh, being included in that. And so now, because the president had made a move, now this man had um, an opportunity to pin them down so that either they may be included in the kingdom of cult uh, uh, um, book, or uh, they may be left out. So 
the men call uh, these people and uh, they ask them what they were their beliefs on the nature of Christ. And then uh, there was some series of uh, exchange of information. And then uh, Donald um, um, uh, Gray Burnhouse actually told them uh, that uh, the Seventh-day Adventist did not believe or E.G. White did not believe in the deity of Christ, but um, uh, 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 she later changed to Trinitarian view being influenced by Uriah Smith. Now, it is interesting the time that um, Uriah Smith released his book, and uh, it is escaping my mind, there's uh, a book that um, Uriah Smith released, and um, what was the name of the book? It was Looking Unto Jesus. The same year, 1898, that uh, Desire of Ages came out. And so some say when Desire of Ages came out, E.G. White changed her views on the Godhead, and she started believing in the Trinity. The same year, Uriah Smith wrote out his book on looking unto Jesus and it came out, which was a non-Trinitarian book. So Donald Gray Burnhouse and Walter Martin brought all the materials of E.G. White that they could uh, find and put there before these uh, people. And they told them, are these your materials? Go through them. And then uh, they said yes. And uh, uh, they were as it is reported that they were in mortal shock. And I don't know what that means in mortal shock. Had they not read the materials, our own materials, or uh, what were they in mortal shock about? And so uh, this is the story developing, and it comes down from A.G. Daniels and Prescott and others trying to overhaul the book Daniel and Revelation and other writings that reflected our fundamental principles that now could change in the future when they change Daniel and Revelation and some standard works that uh, we had. At the end of that series of um, sitting on the table with these uh, apostate evangelicals came out the book Questions on Doctrines, which is a, a very interesting book to go through. If you have never gone through it, then go through it. I haven't gone through it fully, but uh, to some extent. And um, interesting matters there. There are things you will say amen to if you haven't really read what Adventism is in, uh, in actual. So back to this, the next logical, logical and inevitable step in the implementing of our unified fundamental beliefs, not principles, involves a vision of certain standard works uh, so as to eliminate statements that thought taught and thus perpetuated erroneous views on the Godhead. The first and most conspicuous of this involved certain erroneous theological concepts that had long appeared in thoughts on Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. Long appeared. Can you just think about that long appeared? So back in the years of the pioneers, these are erroneous theological concepts on the Godhead. Frum admitted that uh, Smith's book had been accorded an honored place in our Adventist history and even recognized by Ellen White. In 1926, Froome began personal, personal studies on the Holy Spirit and Daniel asked him to give a presentation at the Milwalk General Conference session. This led to an invitation to present a series of um, studies on the same theme at the North American Union Ministerial Institute of 1928. In preparing for these meetings, Froome consulted or consulted the spirit of prophecy and pioneer writing. He was rather shocked, he said. Aside from priceless leads found in the spirit of prophecy, there was practically nothing in our literature setting forth a sound biblical exposition in this tremendous field of study. There was no previous pathfinding books on the question in our literature. Movement of Destiny, page 322. Brothers and sisters, the dead are dead and they cannot defend themselves. And so we cannot ex exhume uh, this man, Leroy Froome, to ask him some question. But the first question that I would like to ask um, Leroy Froome, if he were alive, 
how could he say that there was no pathfinding literature on the Holy Spirit? Does it mean from 1844 to 1955, Adventism had not figured anything on the Holy Spirit. With all those material that we had, didn't we have anything on the Holy Spirit that actually could uh, satisfy Leroy Froome to just write or give the people such a literature without bringing in his own concept? He said that he didn't find any pathfinder in literature about uh, the Holy Spirit. But... Uh, E.G. White and the Pioneers wrote a lot about the Holy Spirit. And uh, we shall be looking at, uh, the. I, I shall be having a series, a whole full series on identity crisis on the Holy Spirit. What the Pioneers said about the Holy Spirit and what E.G. White said about the Holy Spirit and what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. So for Leroy Froome to say he never found any literature on that, it will be a bold day lie for that because there is literature on the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, that were written by our pioneers, that were written by a review and herald publishing houses, and even E.G. White wrote about the Holy Spirit. Continuing with this, um, and uh, now this is a very serious allegation considering what uh, 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 we had uh, shared in the previous section. And uh, mind you, this is not even a snippet of what's was in our literature. There are volumes in our literature on this topic of the spirit. The book Minister of Feeling has a lot to speak on this subject. It's like Froome never read this book. Determined to have sufficient material for the institute meeting, he turned to non-Adventist sources saying, I was compelled to search out a score of valuable books written by men outside of our faith for initial clues and suggestions and to open up beckoning visitors to intensive personal study. Having this, I went on from there. And this is Movement of Destiny, page 322. Is there no balm in Gilead that you go to these uh, uncircumcised fellows to inquire about God? That was the statement that uh, was told one of the kings. And so, um, for Froome to say that there was no pathfinder in literature and then he had to go to these apostate people to apostate prostitutes I mean, that, that's, a, that's not my word that is the, 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 the title they were given in 1840s how could that be that the Lord could not reveal to us anything on this matter and he sends us out to look for information it's like Israel will go to inquire about the sanctuary services in heathen lands and then come and teach themselves about the sanctuary services. This was a pathetic statement by Little Throne that actually uh, I believe that uh, he had to review it before uh, he died. So it is interesting when uh, we think about these things uh, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 20 to 22, there is a very, very interesting uh, story that uh, there was a time that uh, the Israelites had to go to fight with the enemy, but they didn't have any instrument of war. So they went in the camp of the enemy, and what did they do? they went to sharpen their tools there for fighting the same enemy. Israel without weapons of war and going to the Philistine to sharpen their instrument. Think about that. How sure that when they came out with those instruments, they will be better to fight the very people who have sharpened them. If I knew you wanted to fight me, and you come with the instrument of fighting me to sharpen it. How sharper will I make it? And so he went to these people who are opposed to our message to look for information to preach unto them. What an irony. And so
Now, the, the, the current Israel, this is Seventh-day Adventists have become destitute of the instrument of war. They go to the seminaries, colleges of the Philistine and suffer them to sharpen their swords and give them instruments of war and the results have been spiritual quagmire. And uh, this is history repeating itself. Now, Leroy Froom listed some of these men that he went to uh, inquire from. And um, some of them were uh, Dwight, L, Dwight L. Moody, founder of Moody Bible College, and Joseph A. Says, a Lutheran. These were just some of them. Why was there nothing in our literature to help him write about the comforter? Simply because the Holy Spirit believed by the pioneers was different to that which Froome believed. After the institute meeting, this is what actually he had to say. In a letter from Leroy Froome to Dr. Otto H. Christensen, uh, this is what um, Froome was able to say after going to others to find the material. He said, you cannot imagine how I was to mail by some of the old timers because I pressed on the personality of the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead. Now, this is not something new because E.G. White in 1898 had the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead. So Leroy Froome, his view on the personality of the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead is not the belief of E.G. White in 1898 because when he went to our material, he never found anything to help him understand the personality of the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead. He had to go to the other people outside the faith, meaning that our belief of the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead was not what actually Leroy Froome had to believe. Ellen White also used the term third person of the Godhead, but with very different connotation. Following on from the Institute, Froome put his studies in a book called The Coming of the Comforter. Printed that same year, he said this was an urgent request of a hundred ministers who had heard him at the meetings. Coming of the Comforter, page nine, uh, that is, uh, in the book, he emphasized very strongly the personality of the Holy Spirit as a separate being from the Father and Son. It was clearly a Trinitarian understanding. He wrote, we are under the direct personal guidance of the third person of the Godhead as truly as the disciples were under the direct leadership of the second person of the Godhead, the coming of the Comforter, page 23. Now, if you search the Bible and uh, Spirit of Prophecy, you don't find the first person of the Godhead and the second person of the Godhead. But uh, I have had good brothers in understanding saying that this is not nothing because if you have the third then you must have the first and the second but that is not the case because this is the, the the phrase the third person of the godhead is used in a grammatical sense not a title sense but just a grammar of it is own because the holy spirit uh is not a third spirit after the first and the second spirit uh but I, I wouldn't go into that a lot because I'll handle the identity crisis and try to see that. Uh, so there is nothing like the first person and the second person of the Godhead. The phrase, the third person of the Godhead is what I have said, just a, a grammatical uh, phrase and not a title per se. And uh, back in uh, the spring of 1930, A.G. Daniels, uh, this is some... Um, uh, from saying that um, after the coming out of the comforter or after the publishing of the comforter, Froome had a proposition put to him. Now, in the Movement of Destiny, page uh, 17, this is um, what um, we read, the proposition was, and uh, I'll quote it. Back in the spring of 1930, Arthur G. Daniels told me he believed that at a later time, I should undertake a thorough survey of the entire plan of redemption. It is principles, provision, and divine personalities as they unfolded to our view as a movement from 1844 onward, with special emphasis upon the developments of 1888 and its sequel, Movement of Destiny, page 17. 
So now 40 years of age, Froome saw the enormity of the project. He was awed by its magnitude and far-reaching character. He suggested that someone else should do it, but Daniel said he felt it was for me to do, for I had gotten a vision of it and had a, back, a background and burden for it. That is a movement of destiny. Daniel told Froome he was a connecting link between past leaders and the present, but he said, it is to be later, not yet, not yet. That is the moment of destiny. Both men understood the serious problem involved in printing a book on this subject, for it will contain sentiments not acceptable to those who had been close to the early beginnings of the church. Daniels knew that time would be required for certain theological wounds to heal and for attitudes to modify on the part of some. Possibly, it will be necessary to wait until certain individuals had dropped out of action or died before he needed portrayal could, before the needed portrayal could wisely be brought forth. This is Moment of Destiny, page 17. So, Daniel himself knew that uh, the changes of Adventism could not happen while we still had any living pioneer on the scene. It could not be an easy thing. So, he had to let them drop off the scene, die until they could do anything of that sort. And so you cannot just afford to skip over these matters and say, please let the dead rest, don't trouble them. Yes, the dead will rest, no one will trouble them. Subtle changes were taking place. Froome stated that by this time, most conspicuous champions of the drive view of Christ had gone to their rest, and it was felt there would be little opposition and this one you can read it from a movement of destiny page 411 418 later on russell holt wrote a uh, saying in uh, the doctrine of the trinity in the seventh day adventist denomination it is rejection and acceptance uh, in uh, 1969 russell holt wrote uh, the following statement he said this period saw the death of most of the of those pioneers who had championed and held the anti-Trinitarian position. Their place were being taken by men who were changing their thinking or had never opposed the doctrine. The Trinity began to be published until by 1931 it had triumphed and become the standard denominational position. Isolated stalwarts remained who refused to yield, but the outcome had been decided. This is in the doctrine of the Trinity in the Seventh-day Adventist denominational. It is rejection and acceptance in uh, 1969. Now, the, 1960, the 1936 Sabbath school lesson for the fourth quarter was an interesting mixture of Trinitarian language and non-Trinitarian belief, showing the struggle that was going on in the minds of many during this period. And... Uh, in, uh, in, in in the section 42 of uh, the prophet still speaks. This is uh, .co.uk by Terry Hill. That same year, Benjamin, Benjamin Wilkinson, who wrote his book, Truth Triumphant, answered a letter from Dr. T.S. Titus saying, replying to a letter of October 13 regarding the doctrine of the Trinity, I'll say that Seventh-day Adventists do not and never have accepted the dark Mysterious Catholic Doctrine of the Trinity. This is in omega uh, 77com You can get these links. Once the statement of faith and baptismal certificate were printed, Froome said, we were now ready to go all to all the world with everlasting gospel message in a clear and more compelling way. The culminating events of the decade 1931 and 1941 consequently marked the end of an old epoch and the beginning of a new day in unification and auspicious witness for us as a movement. It was definitely another major turning point in denominational history. Very interesting movement of destiny, page 421-422. Uh, Froome says that we are now ready to go all over the world with an everlasting gospel. And what is that everlasting gospel? To preach the Trinity. Because if they really went to, to preach the truth, then why are we here today? We shouldn't be here. But they thought that now they had found the truth and now they were ready to go throughout the, all the world. Why? Because 
the apostates will readily accept what they were saying and they will face no opposition and they will sit on the same table, eat, laugh and go their way. But we are here until today when Froome said that they were now ready to go to the whole world with the message. What did E.G. White say that should go everywhere in the world, in every church and in every land? In 1888 messages, this is what she had to say. This is what she had to say. Uh, and uh, it is in 1888 messages, page 886, paragraph 3. What was to go to the whole world, every church and every land? She says, I feel my spirit stirred within me. I feel to the depth of my being that the truth must be born to other countries and nations and to all classes. Let the missionaries of the cross proclaim that there is one God and one mediator between God and man who is Jesus Christ, the son of the infinite God. This needs to be proclaimed throughout every church in our land. Christians need to know this and not put man where God should be, that they may no longer be worshippers of idols, but the living of, but, uh, of the living God. Idolatry exists in our churches. Means head better be employed to save souls from death, which will be placing jewels in the crown of Jesus Christ and stars in our crowns in the kingdom of heaven. That the message, every missionary should preach that there is one God and one mediator between God and man who is Jesus Christ, the son of the infinite God. But now here, little from is saying, after the coming out of the comforter, which had to set forth better the personality of the Holy Spirit, and brought in the understanding of the Trinity. Now they were set and ready to go out to the old world. When the prophet in 1888 messages, he says another thing completely different from what Frum is saying. Should we help these men? No. Should we pray for them? They are dead. Only what we can do is go through the history and amend things that should be amended. If the pillars be destroyed, Psalm 11.3, what shall the righteous do? And so God moves in a mysterious ways. The book Little Room was asked to write at the request of Arthur G. Daniels is the very book from which we learn the details of the change in our denomination's teaching on the doctrine of God. Little did he realize that God would use his own material to trace the change from truth to error. So did Daniels and Froome deliberately foist something they knew to be evil upon the church? Probably not. Both men had come to believe in the Trinity and this affected everything they did. Froome believed he had eradicated from the church the Arian heresy, which he did not believe was Christian by editing out the things that were in the book, uh, Daniel and the Revelation. There were more to come later. And uh, in 1946, small portions of Ellen White articles were placed in a compilation called Evangelism. This will be a very important volume in the process of change. Those on the committee were A. L. White, W. H. Branson, R. A. Anderson, Miss Louis Closer, and J. L. Schuller. Under the heading "Misrepresentation of the Godhead," critical portions of the prophet's articles were clearly and uh, um, uh, they were clearly put out of order. But articles that insinuated to the Trinity were placed together, men not even complete sentences, but just lines out of context. Think about that. When reading the statement under such a heading, a subtle message is given. The book Evangelism achieved its first post and uh, from was elected. Years later, he wrote to Anderson saying, you know what it did with men in the Columbia Union. They either had to lay down their arms and accept those statements or else they had to reject the spirit of prophecy. And um, this is letter from Leroy Froome to Roy Allen Anderson, January 8, 1966. In fact, it was worked so well that even today evangelism is one of the first books used in Trinitarian discussion. And uh, it is true to deny the portrayed message of the chapter appears to be a denial of the spirit of prophecy. Herein lies the power of subheadings connected with incomplete sentences and small portions of paragraphs lifted out of context. And then we are told these are E.G. White materials. And if you reject them, you are rejecting her. 
And so, uh, in this, the, the issue of compiling materials and out of context, I just want to read something in uh, Selected Messages Book 1 about compiling the materials out of uh, it is context and what E.G. White had to say. She said, there's another fact that should be stated here. I am not responsible for all that has been printed as coming from me. About the time that uh, my earliest visions were first published, several articles did appear purporting to have been written by me and to relate that the Lord had shown me, but san sanctioning doctrines which I did not believe. These were published in a paper edited by a Mr. Curtis. Of the name of the paper, I am not certain. In the years of care and labor that have passed since then, some of these less important particulars have been forgotten, but the main points are still distinct in my head. She says, this man took articles that came from my pen and wholly transformed and distorted them, picking out a sentence here and there without giving the connection. And then after inserting his own ideas, he attached my name to them as if they came direct from me. On seeing these articles, we wrote to him, expressing our surprise and uh, disapprobation. Sorry. <clears throat> and forbidding him thus to misconstrue my testimonies. He answered that he should publish what he pleased that, and that he knew the vision ought to say what he had published and that if I had written them as the Lord gave them to me, they would have said these things. He asserted that if the visions have been given for the benefit of the church, he had a right to use them as he pleased. Some of these sheets may still be in existence and may be brought forward as coming from me, but I am not responsible for them. The articles given in early writings did pass under my eye and as the edition of experience and views published in 1851 was the earliest which we possessed, and as we had no knowledge of anything additional in papers or pamphlets of earlier date, I am not responsible for the omissions which are said to exist. Continued on, she says, <clears throat> there are some who upon accepting erroneous theories, strive to establish them by collecting from my writing statements of truth which they use separated from their proper connection and perverted by association with error. Thus seeds of heresy springing up and growing rapidly into strong plants are surrounded by many precious plants of truth. And in this way, a mighty effort is made to vindicate the genuineness of the superior plants. 5 MR 154.1. And now all who have a desire for truth, I will say, do not give credence to unauthenticated reports as to what Sister White has done or said or written. If you desire to know what the Lord has revealed through her, read her published works. Are there any points of interest concerning which she has not written? Do not eagerly catch up and report rumors as to what she has said. 5T or Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 696, paragraph 1. Again, she says, they come to me, those that are copying my writings and say, now here is the better revised words, and I think I'll put that in. Don't you change one word, not a word. The revised edition we do not need at all. We have got the word that Christ has spoken himself and given us. And don't you in my writings change a word for any revised edition. There will be revised editions, plenty of them, just before the close of this earth history. And I want all my workers to understand, and I have got quite a number of them. I want them to understand that they are never to take the revised word and put it in the place of the plain symbol word just as they are. They think they are improving them, but how do they know but that they may, may switch off on an idea and give it less important than Christ means them to have, MS 188-1907. And so this project that was being undertaken by Daniels and uh, Prescott and Little form to change or to overhaul the materials did not end up good. In uh, 1952, a book was copyrighted called Principles of Life and printed in 1956. 
It has been used by school children as their Bible doctrine study book. One paragraph says, while God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three separate and distinct beings, yet they are one in nature, in character, in purpose. That is pages 34. Working in such a close relationship as to be one. Principles of Life, page 28. The wording beings will probably be acceptable to Trinitarians today as they understand the word being. But uh, when it is brought to the scrutiny, it will be so difficult to be accepted by other people. And so time moves on and uh, 1955, uh, Walter Martin, an evangelical working in harmony with Donald G. or Gray Burnhouse, editor of Eternity magazine, has approached the church leaders to meet and discuss the beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists. He was working a book um, about cults and wanted to know what we believed. Martin was acquainted with T. Edgar Unruh through correspondence, and he knew of room through the, his volumes on history. The meeting was arranged between Roy Allen Anderson, Walter E. Reed, and Leroy E. Froome, with the full approval of General Conference President Ruben R. Figueroa, uh, T. Uh, Edgar Anru acted as a chairman, and uh, uh, Ruben R. Figawa had, uh, as I said earlier, had been listening to Donald uh, Gray Burnhouse uh, present out the series on righteousness by faith and uh, send him steps to Christ to help him understand it better. And then he had an opportunity of calling these men together uh, and uh, ask them what they believe. Now, what was being written? The book on the cults. And uh, I don't know if our work is to defend ourselves before the world, if we are a cult or not. But God has given us a very solemn work, the proclamation of the first, the second, and the third angel's message, and nothing should preoccupy our time. But this brethren had a time to continue for weeks and months in dialogue with these people. Were Adventists a cult? That was the question of the evangelicals. Martin had furnished the group with a long list of questions, and it was Leroy Froome's task to write out the answers. He had stayed up until 2 a.m., and in the morning was able to hand over 20 pages of notes. It was a momentous day. After the discussion was over, Martin announced that he had been mistaken about several of our teachings and had come to the conclusion that Adventists were not a cult. Extending the hand of fellowship, he said, no, you are definitely not a cult. Seventh-day Adventists can be accepted as fellow evangelicals by the mainland Protestant churches of America. He then asked that our denominational leaders be sent a series of questions on our major beliefs, the answers to be acceptable to ecumenicals. This will be placed in articles for Eternity magazine. He also asked the denomination to write a book for all church members on the beliefs given in the meetings and have it sent to Protestant public libraries throughout the world. Martin himself will publish his book, Exonerating Seventh-day Adventist. There is no doubt Martin was seeking to cement the answers given by our leaders as his reputation and that of the evangelical leaders were at stake. In September 1956, an article appeared in Eternity that Burnhouse called a bombshell article. Few will be in position to read it, but word spread by word of mouth. Two months later, an article appeared in Ministry Magazine under the title Changing Attitudes of Adventism, an article by Froome Akamban, the heading and title, The Atonement, The Heart of a Message. You can look at uh, www.sdadefend.com for these uh, things. The meeting which Martin covered are um, important doctrine areas. The meetings with Martin covered important doctrinal areas, such as the investigative judgment, the nature of Christ, the atonement, sinless perfection. Some years later, Roy Allen Anderson said he had been asked before the meetings began, what do you folks believe about the Trinity? Adventist Review, September 8, 1983, page 3. This aspect is not often highlighted. One can study the Eternity Magazine articles and not realize this subject was even part of the discussions. Anderson's comments continued. The answers to their honest questions lengthened into days of prayerful discussions. Our answer concerning the Godhead and the Trinity was crucial, for in some of the books they had read, 
Adventist were classed as Arians. And Adventist Review, September 8, 1983, paragraph 3. At Campus Hill Church in, in 1989, Loma Linda, Walter Martin said the following words. When I first met with Leroy Edwin Froome, he took me to task for about 15 minutes on how I could ever possibly think that Adventism was a cult. Adventism rings as true as steel, I said. Do you think Arias was a Christian? He was an excellent church historian and he said, of course he wasn't a Christian. He denied the deity of Jesus Christ. I said, that is Walter Martin, so did Ellen White. Dr. Froome replied, what? I said, yes, and opened up a suitcase and produced at least 12 feet of Adventist publication stacked up and marked for Dr. Froome's perusal. And for the perusal of the committee to check the sources in there, Walter Martin taped conference at Campus Hill Church in Loma Linda, January 8, 1989. He said the committee was in mortal shock and Martin went on to say that Ellen White had denied the eternal deity of Christ in the beginning, relegating him to the place of a second deity, but that she later changed her belief and taught the Trinity, being influenced by Uriah Smith. Remember uh, the, 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 the coming out of the book by Uriah Smith, looking unto Jesus in 1898, and the coming out of Desire of Ages in 1898. And so it is thought that this was the shift from... Uh, the belief in Arianism to Trinitarianism, according to what Martin is speaking about here, and some in our circles. The suggestion that Uriah Smith influenced the prophet is ridiculous by itself, by the way. Smith wrote a book called Looking Unto Jesus, the same year Ellen White printed Desire of Ages. And this book, Looking Unto Jesus, was clearly non Trinitarian. Both were advertised in the same church papers. So, how could these two leading people? E.G. White, 1898, produce a book on Trinity. Uriah Smith produces a book completely non-Trinitarian, and they appear in the same article for advertisement. Is in this Babylon, is in this confusion, is in this uh, apostasy of the highest order. And there was no uh, uh, um, there was no noise about it. People accepted those books out, but how could they accept two books which were talking different things and opposed to each other? Yeah, it, it doesn't sound uh, the right thing. It took some days for the committee to produce the materials. When they met again, it was stated, well, a great deal of these things are there and we agree with you and we don't agree with the statements. I want us to be careful on what we are reading here. Because the statement of Martin is this. Do you think Arias was a Christian? Was an excellent church history. This is uh, 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 this is uh, Leroy Froome. Of course, he wasn't a Christian. He denied the date of Jesus Christ. This is Leroy Froome answering. Arias was not a Christian because he denied the date of Christ. And... Martin said, so did Ellen White. So if Arias is not a Christian, so there goes the statement, E.G. White was not a Christian. Arias denied the date of Jesus Christ. E.G. White relegated the date of Christ to the second deity, as Arias did. And so the two are not Christian. And so the greatest thing here now to reconcile is from saying, that Arias was not a Christian, so admitting that E.G. White, in a sense, was not a Christian. And they were in mortal shock that E.G. White was not a Christian, or we believe as Arias believed. Down here, Leroy Froome agreed with the material of that Walter Martin had put before him, that these things were so... E.G. White was an Arias, in quotes, not a Christian. And so what? He says that uh, we don't agree with the statements. Now, it means this. If 1898 was the shift into Trinitarianism, when E.G. White moved from relegating 
Jesus to second deity, to his full deity. Then prior to that year, all the statements she made, Little Ephraim is saying he does not agree with them. And he agrees with Walter Martin that E.G. White changed into Trinitarianism. And after that, that is when he agrees with E.G. White. But remember the issue here is with also with Daniels and Little Ephraim that Daniels told him that he will be the connecting link of the past ministers and the present or the future one. And certain changes could not be made while the old gods were still living until they passed off the scene. Then they could be changed because it will need theological healing. The wounds will have to be healed. And when these things appeared, some of the old standard bearers refused, rejected and opposed them. But then he had selected statements out of context because the prior materials E.G. White had written were non-Trinitarian, if I may say that in prior to 1898, because they say this, there is the shift. So he lifted the points out of their context and then mixed with others after 1898 and put together and then now says, this is the belief of E.G. White. So how could he put the older statements, which were non-Trinitarian, with the post-1898 Trinitarian statements, and then mingle the two together and say that now this is the belief of E.G. White. You either accept these statements, or if you refuse them, you are rejecting E.G. White. And uh, sometimes this is what people do. They, they bring up things and they say, this is E.G. White saying, if, and if you refuse it, you are refusing her. This is no new tactic. The enemy has used it ever before. But Christ was able to note how Satan uses these statements out of context. In the temptation in Matthew chapter 4, Satan quoted scriptures to try to tempt Jesus Christ. If he denied to do that, then he would be denying the Bible. But Christ was so clever and wise that he never took the lifted sentences from their context, but was able to quote the full context of the issue and said, the Lord says this. For Satan, the work of Satan is to lift up statements from their context. And he uses men to do this. So that you may seem that if you deny this, you are denying the Bible. But if everything will be read in context, it will be seen that it was a trap of the enemy. So it took some days for the committee to peruse the material. When they met again, it was stated, well, a great deal of these things are there and we agree with you and we don't agree with the statements. They do not reflect Orthodox Adventist theology and we reject it. Donald Barnhouse wrote in his Eternity magazine in uh, September 1956. Immediately it was perceived that the Adventists were strenuously denying certain doctrinal position which had been previously attributed to them. So even Martin, who is putting to task Little Ephraim, and with his old traps, understands that Little Ephraim is really denying the doctrinal positions which had been held by Adventists as a body. The Adventists specifically repudiate any teachings by ministers or members of their faith who have believed, proclaimed, and written any matter which would classify them among Arians, meaning that before that, Adventist was a, a, a class of Arians, if you may say in quotes. Oh. Ob obviously, historian George Knight and William Johnson were correct in saying our doctrines have been changed. However, the change began much earlier than uh, the Martin and Burnhouse episode. Concluding these meetings, a book was published entitled Seventh Day Adventist Under Questions of Doctrine, prepared by a representative group of Seventh Day Adventist leaders. Bible teachers and editors, questions on doctrine, front page 1957, section four on the deity and eternal pre-existence of Christ states, it is frequently charged that Seventh-day Adventists deny the actual deity and eternal pre-existence of Christ, the eternal word. The question is then asked, do you believe in the Trinity? So look how things are changed. In uh, section four, the issue is, that Seventh-day Adventists actually deny the actual deity and the 
eternal preexistence of Christ. And so, if you don't believe in the Trinity, then according to Walter Martin, you don't believe in the actual deity and the eternal pre-existence of Christ, the eternal word. It is only when you believe in the Trinity that you can be classed as a person believing in the actual date of Jesus Christ. What a way of trapping these people. So the question that is asked concerning that statement is then, do you believe in the Trinity? Question on Doctrine, page 35. The answer is very subtle. Our belief in the deity and eternal preexistence of Christ, the second person of the Godhead, is on record in our fundamental beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists, appearing annually in our official yearbook and in our authoritative church manual. Moreover, those who are baptized into the Adventist church subscribe to the summary of doctrinal beliefs appearing on our standard baptismal certificate. This is uh, uh, questions on doctrine page uh, 35. The way had been prepared many years earlier. After the publishing or after the printing of this book, Donald Bernhardt stated, the Adventists fortunately deny the logical conclusion to which their doctrines must lead them, i.e. a negation of the full validity of the atonement of Christ. Now, it is interesting, if you don't believe in the Trinity, again, you don't believe in the atonement. Very interesting way Walter Martin was leading these people and trapping them into his own uh, 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 Pandora box. Don't believe in the Trinity, you don't believe in the deity, you don't believe in the atonement. And so it is interesting to read the history of Adventism and how they have been trapped and have had a, an identity crisis. It was suggested that the denomination go on public record denying certain erroneous statements. Our response was no. Those early statements were the declaration of individuals or groups, not of the church as a whole and had never, committed the, had never committed to the denomination. Our later formal declaration were clear, biblical and sound, sound and orthodox. Movement of Destiny, page 483. Now, we are told that these earlier statements were declaration of individuals or groups. When we had the fundamental When uh, we had the fundamental principles of 1872, 1889, not prepared by individuals or accepted by individuals, but taken as uh, what the church will summarize was, was their beliefs. But now this one, Leroy Froome says that they were declaration and statements of individuals or groups. Whether to call Leroy Froome a liar or uh, 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 a bearer of false witness, I don't know which one will do. Now, but the evangelical insisted, finally a statement was prepared which read, the belief of Seventh-day Adventists on this great truth is clear and emphatic, and we feel that we should not be identified with or stigmatized for certain limited and faulty concept held by some particularly in our formative years. This statement should therefore nullify the stock quotations that have been circulated against us. Questions on doctrine, question number three, page 31 and 32 quoted in Movement of Destiny, page 484. So questions on doctrines further states. But with the passage of years, the earlier diversity of views on certain doctrines gradually have gave way to unity of view. Clear and sound positions were then taken by the great majority on such doctrines as the Godhead, the deity, and eternal preexistence of Christ, and the personality of the Holy Spirit. A few, however, held to some of their former views, and at times these ideas got into print. However, for decades now, the church has been practically at one on the basic truths of the Christian faith. Listen to this statement. However, for decades now, the church has been practically at one on the basic truth of the Christian faith. Not Adventist faith, but Christian faith. So what is the Christian faith? Believe in Trinity. 
believe in another third being and connected to Christ and the Father. It had been agreed upon that questions on doctrine will be placed in Martin's bookshop as well as his book, The Truth About Seventh-day Adventist, and that both books will be available through the Adventist Book Center. According to Ralph Ways, a non-Adventist who has studied Adventist uh, for many years, the ABC did not carry Martin's books. Leroy Frum said he was indebted to the spirit of prophecy and Ellen White's contribution to questions on doctrine. He wrote, we here unfold the Ellen White coverage on the date of Christ and its involvement. Uh, this is sad. Why? Because Little Froome said when he was writing about the coming of the Comforter, he did not find any pathfinder in literature to help him write these things. But now in the questions and doctrine and movement of destiny, he says, this is now E.G. White materials. We here unfold the Ellen White coverage on the date of Christ and its involvement. It is sublime in scope. Here is penetration, comprehensiveness, balance, dependability. No other writer in our ranks has ever approached it in coverage. Our greatest theologians have not come anywhere near to matching it is impressive outline or content. We have nothing to be ashamed of and everything to be proud of in Ellen White's contribution to the full truth of the date of Christ in this day of widespread challenge and repudiation of his eternal pre-existent and complete deity, his atoning death, literal resurrection, actual ascension, and imminent personal return. Here is an anchor, a guideline, a blueprint to have and to use. Here is set forth the solid faith of Seventh-day Adventist Movement of Destiny, page 494, paragraph 5. When in the few last pages, he had just said that uh, he rejects those statements by E.G. White in her earlier writings. But now he says, here is the E.G. White writings setting forth the truth. Which one do you take? We wonder what Ellen White would have said about her contribution to questions on doctrine. The most controversial book in our recent history. This sounds like Kellogg saying the living temple is in harmony with Sister White's writings, to which E.G. White will say, far be it, the sentiments in living temple harmonizes with my writing. And so we are where we are now. And the church is continuing in the same footsteps. First, it started with overhauling the standard work, changing the materials in Daniel and Re Revelation. And then in from rejecting the earlier statements of E.G. White post prior 1898 and then accepting post 1898 as if there was a transition and then why could he not produce them in the times of the pioneers? Daniel says, because they could not accept such a thing and they had to pass off the sin first. And then even after them passing off, it will take time for theological wounds to be healed because of the new book, The Coming of the Comforter the questions on doctrines and the movement of destiny. And so here you have the story. And uh, we will rest at this point and ask ourselves, whom shall we run to and whom shall we believe? We have our Bibles. We can read for ourselves. And Ijuat says that there will be a people on the earth who will maintain the Bible. Not that her materials will be discarded, but they'll have to go and prove everything from the Bible. And as it seems right now, no one is proving anything from the Bible and no one is ready to defend Adventism because everything about the Adventism has been distorted from fundamental principles to fundamental beliefs to now being aligned 
with the Christian faith of the world and being acceptable by everyone. The peculiar people are no longer peculiar. It was as if Israel were in Babylon, built the houses there, comfortable, and at the time of coming back to their land to rebuild uh, uh, the temple of the Lord, Ezra expect, uh, uh, inspects the priest, but he could find none. And they had so immersed themselves in Babylonian religion and culture until most of them did not want to go back to their own land. Their children speak the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the Jewish language. Yet they had to read the Hebrew text and understand the requirements of the temple, it is a sacrificial system, and to restore it according to the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, to restore the temple. But they could not do that because they were Babylonian at that time. They had taken up another identity and they were not just Israel in apostasy, apostasy but they were, they speak half the language of Ashdod and they could not understand their own language. It is the prophetic parallels with the Israel of today. That Israel, the ancient Israel, when they went back to rebuild the temple, they wanted to do everything that Babylon had been doing. And then came about the Roman influence or the Roman element. In so much that when Jesus Christ came, he was rejected because these people were in their land, literal Israel, but their education, their theology, their beliefs was Babylonian and it was Roman. And there is where we stand right now. We are here talking about the loud cry, rebuilding Adventism, but literally we are Seventh-day Adventists, but our theology, our beliefs, and everything is Babylon and corrupted with Roman element. I'd like to close with the, the wonderful quote in uh, uh, 1SM, As we bring this to an end, the trials and the attitude. When I say 406 paragraph 1, here is where we close. We want to understand the time in which we live. We do not have understand it. We do not have take it in. My heart trembles in me when I think of what a fool we have to meet and how poorly we are prepared to meet him. The trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just before the first coming of Christ have been presented before me again and again to illustrate the position of the people of God in their experience before the second coming of Christ. How the enemy sought every occasion to take control of the minds of the Jewish and today he is seeking to blind the minds of God's servants that they may not be able to discern the precious truth. Their trials and their attitude are our trials. And uh, in PP, there's something so interesting in uh, uh, PP. We are told what Saturn is. Uh, Satan is trying to repeat the same things that he, he did to Israel. And uh, this is PP 668.3 to 689.1. Satan was determined to keep hold on the land of Canaan. And when it was made the habitation of the children of Israel, and the law of God was made the law of the land, he hated Israel with a cruel and malignant hatred and plotted their destruction. 
Though the agency of evil spirit, spirit strange gods were introduced through the agency of evil spirit, strange gods were introduced. And because of transgression, the chosen people were finally scattered from the land of promise. This history Satan is striving to repeat in our day. God is leading his people out from the abominations of the world that they may keep his law. And because of this, the rage of the accuser of our brethren knows no bounds. The devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Revelation 12, 10 and 11, uh, 10 and 12. The antitypical land of promise is just before us and Satan is determined to destroy the people of God and cut them off from their inheritance. The admonition, watch ye and pray lest you enter into temptation. Mark 14, 38 was never more needed than now. The word of the Lord to ancient Israel is addressed also to his people in this age. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them for all that do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And uh, we are seeking a people who are filled with familiar spirits to get from them information and say that now we are set to go to the world to present the everlasting gospel, seeking from the people who consult familiar spirit in their worship, seeking the people that uh, consult the dead. They don't believe the dead are dead. And so they can be given information and we take from them and say this is verity. We have to wonder. God says that have no regard for these people, but we can have a regard for them. Go to their seminaries, go to their theological schools, and come back equipped to teach the church that has to teach the three angels' messages. How the enemy has trained us to reject the truth while professing to preserve it. And so may the Lord have mass upon us and uh, May he touch our hearts. He says that he will send Elijah, that he may turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and the fathers to the children, lest he come and strike the land with the curse. We pray that we may be possessed with the spirit of Elijah and do the will of God at such a time as this. Shall we pray? Dear God, thank you once again because you are seeking to restore us both uh, spiritually, theologically, social, and physically. And uh, if we can only put ourselves in that position to hear thy voice, Lord, we shall be glad. But uh, can uh, an Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard change his spots? Never. But the Lord can do the impossibility. And Adventism can still ring as still and be not ashamed of what they believe. Having walked the, this advance of faith, we can still say the Lord has been amongst us. And still we want to say that in truth and in spirit. And so help us, Lord, to renounce the errors amongst us and accept the truth once delivered to the saints. Look for that narrow way and follow it in Jesus' name. Amen.